So now I'm going to talk to you about science. And there is a problem, a very big problem with science, and especially physics. Now, when you were at school, I'm sure that they did a little thing with you where you had either a trolley or a ball on an incline, and you rolled it down the incline and you timed it. Maybe if you were lucky, you had electronics. If you were very unlucky, you had a regular stopwatch. Now, the regular stopwatch would have been incredibly inaccurate. Um, the electronics would have been pretty accurate. And then they got you to calculate it after doing the experiment using some physical formulas that were developed actually pre-Victorian but they were developed very early on in physics and those formulae are still used today and Sir Isaac Newton was one of the developers of, of this type of physical formula and when you gave your results to the teacher and he saw that they were different, in some cases quite radically different, especially if you had a normal uh, stopwatch, then your teacher said to you, oh look, this is experimental error. Yes, that's right, experimental error. And that the differences in real life um, from the calculation would be very very small and you would ignore these differences because they would be caused by your measurement method now in actual fact this is a load of rubbish all it is is that these equations are very very much simplified and they only work if they're simplified because once you you get an awful lot of variables in an equation it tends to become chaotic. Now just think for a minute about that sliding ball stroke um, trolley experiment on an incline. Now we'll say the incline's fixed, we'll say that you've got a Teflon ball and Teflon um, slider so that Friction might not be an issue, it still will be, but hey, you've taken it out of the equation. So what else would influence it? Hmm, okay. Try which direction that you actually slide the ball in. And depending where you are on the planet, and whether your ball is facing east or west or north or south, you will find that you get very different answers. And in fact, we kind of pointed this out to our teacher when we were at school, because we did our experiment quite quickly, um, because we were lucky enough to be one of the two groups that had an electronic stopwatch with a um, what was at the time described as a magic eye, uh, <laughs> a photo cell. And so we could do our experiments quite quickly. We didn't have to do like 25 and then average the results or something. So we spent the time thinking, well, you know, what happens if you do it this way? And it turned out, if you did it east-west, there was quite a difference from doing it west-east. So, hmm. And uh, this, of course, is down to the rotation of the planet. And when you do when you use the formulae um, obviously gravity the value of gravity has something to do with it well sorry to say the value of gravity does actually change the normal figure that's given is just an average it can be radically different depending on where you are especially if you're next to a big mountain or something so that's another thing and the big thing that changes the value of gravity is the position of the moon and this is what causes tides you can have up to a six percent difference in gravity depending on how far the moon is away from the earth which also varies depending on whether the moon is straight overhead or the other side of the planet 
and that's going to make a big difference to the results. Now, do you think the equations that you're given and the equations that scientists use plumb in all these variables? And this is just a simple example. There are much more complicated ones to do with fluid viscosities and things like that. And anyone who's ever worked on radio circuits, especially at the high end, at the microwave end, will tell you that uh, <laughs> the equations just get you to a start point. Um, let me just tell you a little anecdote here. When I used to work for a radar company some time ago, we had this guy in the lab. He used to shuffle around in a torn t-shirt, baggy jeans, an old pair of sandals, and he earned anyone, more than anyone else in that lab. What did he do? Well, it was his job to take the circuits that had been designed by a computer and by really highly qualified engineers and make them work. Because guess what? Straight out of the box, they would very rarely, if ever, work. And in fact, some of the high power circuits, the microwave circuits that were high power that handled, say, a megawatt, each one had to be made differently. He would take these peculiarly shaped pieces of copper and he would take some files and some bits of sandpaper and because at microwave um, frequencies, the performance of a circuit is very dependent on its shape, its physical shape. And he would reshape these circuits from the ideal computer design, which didn't work, to a real circuit, which actually did work. And because of this, he was paid a lot of money. Now, he didn't calculate anything. He just knew that if he connected it up to the test equipment and played around with it in a certain way, and he, was, and he seemed to be the only person with the uh, nous to know how to play with it, that he could get them to work. Now, the company was taken over by the Germans. And the Germans didn't like this much because the Germans were all about engineering efficiency. And <laughs> one of the first things they did is that they really peed this guy off because they said to him, right, um, this should all be calculatable, we don't need your services anymore, go back into production and do this instead. So this guy left and he was immediately snapped up by a major radar competitor. And needless to say, the Germans suddenly found that they had these brilliantly designed one megawatt radar systems that they now could not get working because each one had to be different. And the only person who knew how to tweak them or fettle them, as we English would say, was actually no longer employed by the company. Oh dear. So one of the biggest radar systems that they had had to be taken out of service. And its replacement, guess what, didn't work as well. Um, yeah, there were plenty of tolerances there, and the machine version would actually kind of work most of the time, but it didn't do as good a job. And this is the lesson that we need to learn about science, that scientists don't necessarily tell us the truth all the time. They tell us what is convenient for them to tell us what they wish us to know. And the same applies with the way they talk to other scientists. Now they will publish a paper which, in theory, should make an experiment reproducible by lots of other scientists around the world. Guess what? Most of the time, it isn't. And the reason why is they leave out these little things which I think, oh, they're unimportant. And it turns out to be the key to getting the thing working. Um, it's just a nightmare, really. Now, I'm going to, as another illustration, tell you something about a thing called the three-body problem. Now, you would think that if you had three bodies hanging in space, and they had a gravitational attraction between them, and they were moving, 
that physics would have a way of calculating their exact motions. Well, physics doesn't. Maths cannot calculate that problem. As soon as you have more than two bodies, you are stuffed. Um, and maths can only give you an, a, a real approximation to what's going on, a kind of a educated guess. And this is why spacecraft have to make mid-course corrections and course corrections all the time because it's not exactly calculable. And most of these natural applications for physics, they require you to know to something like 15 decimal places what the initial conditions are because they're chaotic. And if you look up chaos theory, you will see that one of the things is that a chaotic system is very sensitive to initial conditions. This has been called the butterfly wing effect. It is my opinion that someone somewhere needs to revisit the entirety of Victorian science. Physics, uh, electronics, especially electronics, because there are a lot of weird things that go on in electronics that you cannot explain that don't always happen, but they happen occasionally, and simulators and things like that are used to design circuits simply don't take these things into account because nobody knows why the hell they happen. Um, and I think that until someone has the guts to remove the entirety of the underpinnings of our current knowledge of science, and say, look, it's all wrong, this should happen, this should happen, these are inaccurate, these equations just only sort of work. You know, I mean, they're okay for kids, they're lies for children. But in the real world, they don't work. And until we find something that in the real world actually works, then I think that we need to hang our heads in shame and stop saying, oh, we're brilliant scientists and we know what's going on, because in actual fact, we don't. We've got some maths that models things, and we don't always know the underpinnings behind that maths. And we ignore things that we think are irrelevant, when in fact, they are actually the key to the problem. Anyway, I hope you've enjoyed this little rant, which was provoked by a discussion between myself and a physicist. Um, which incidentally I won <laughs> and um, if you find it interesting entertaining please like and subscribe thank you very much bye now